Hello and welcome to lecture 23 of analog integrated circuit design. In the previous lecture we discussed the MOS model in great detail, we looked at the MOS large and small signal models and at the end of the lecture we were looking at a description of mismatch of MOS transistors. We could describe the mismatch in MOS transistors by two parameters, mismatch in the current factor beta and the mismatch in the threshold voltage Vt. Now in this lecture what we will do is look at how to use these parameters to calculate whatever we want in a circuit. We will take an example circuit of a current mirror and calculate the amount of mismatch. Okay. We will take the simple example of a current mirror I am sure all of you are familiar with this we have a diode connected transistor M0 and M1 here and we will assume operation in saturation region and negligible dependence on VDS so that the current here is nominally identical to I0. Okay. Now a current mirror is the perfect example with which to do mismatch calculations because a current mirror after all is supposed to replicate the current exactly. So any error due to mismatch will contribute to error in the output and will be of some concern. We have to see how to control the amount of mismatch so that the output is within a certain accuracy of the input current. Okay. Obviously I have assumed that each of these has the same size W and L. Okay. Now how do we describe the mismatch in the MOS transistor? So if uh, this has VT1, the second transistor has VT1 plus delta VT and if M0 has a certain uh, current factor beta 1 this has beta 1 plus delta beta okay so the current in the second transistor is given by let me call this uh, maybe i'll change the notation here let me call this M1 and M2 and I will call this I2, I2 is nominally equal to I0. Okay. Okay. Now there are many ways of uh, calculating this. We know what VGS is based on beta 1 and VT1 and so on okay, and the current I0 right. So I0 is nothing but beta 1 by 2 VGS minus VT squared. Okay. Now there are many ways to calculate this, you can expand this expression. And the key to any mismatch calculation is to neglect second and higher order terms and keep only first order terms of the mismatch quantities. Okay. So that means that we will uh, okay. if we have terms like delta Vt square or uh, delta Vt times delta beta that is coming in we will neglect all those things and we will consider only terms containing either delta beta or delta Vt. Okay. This is because the mismatch itself is assumed to be a relatively small compared to the nominal value and that is the normal condition anyhow. So this is a good approximation. Okay. Now when you do this what happens is because we uh, retain only the linear terms we get uh, something related to delta beta and something related to delta Vt and a linear combination of the two. Okay. 
Now, if you recall how the small signal uh, uh, models and small signal analysis was derived, it is by retaining first order expressions only in the incremental quantities. Okay. Now, if you have a circuit with a number of voltages and you increment all of them in the small signal approximation, you neglect the squares of the increments or the cross products of the increments and so on okay. and you retain only the first order terms and exactly the same thing will be done for mismatch as well. So, I suggest that you go through the whole exercise of calculating the complete expression and neglecting the higher order terms and making sure that that is exactly what you will get by the simplified analysis that I am going to show. Okay. There is nothing profound in this, it is something very simple, I am going to calculate only the first order terms. Okay. Let me copy over these expressions. Now, because I know already that I will get two terms, one related to delta beta and one related to delta Vt and the sum of those two. So, instead of going through the whole calculation, I will first assume that I have only delta beta okay, and no delta Vt. In that case, this expression would be beta 1 plus delta beta by 2 times Vgs minus Vt square because I was anyway going to neglect the product of delta beta and delta Vt, this is a good enough approximation. Okay. So, the effect of delta beta would be that I 2 simply equals beta 1 plus delta beta from here divided by beta 1 times I naught or 1 plus delta beta by beta 1 times I naught. Now, given that beta 1 is the current factor, this is exactly what you would have expected. right? So, if there is an error in the factor, you will get 1 plus the error in the factor divided by the nominal factor times the current. Okay. Now, secondly, I will assume that there is only delta V t. In that case, this turns to beta 1 by 2 V g s minus V t plus delta V t sorry V t plus delta V t whole square. Okay. Again I can go through the exercise of uh, expanding this and neglecting higher order terms in delta V t. What I will do is I will rewrite this as V g s minus delta V t minus V t square. Now, this is a very common trick that is used and you can see that an increment in V t by delta V t is equal to reducing V g s by delta V t. Okay. In all the expressions of the MOSFET, we only get V g s minus V t together. Okay. We will never get V g s and V t separately. This is a fundamental thing. This is because the effective voltage across the gate oxide between the gate and the channel is V g s minus V t. V t is the sum of all those internal drops between different materials and so on. So, the amount of charge in the channel is related to V g s minus V t and everything else comes from that. So, you only get V g s minus V t together. So, in general any change in uh, V t can be ascribed to a change in V g s without changing the uh, result. Okay. This is an equivalent modeling trick that we can use. Now, what does this mean? What I am saying is instead of uh, thinking of this uh, second transistor as a transistor whose threshold voltage has changed, I will assume that there is a change in the gate source voltage of the transistor by an amount delta V t. Whatever V g s appears here, it is reduced by delta V t when it comes there okay. and delta V t is a small uh, quantity. right? So, the voltage here is V g s minus delta V t. Also, you see that this is an increment minus delta V t over a nominal value of V g s. Okay. Now, if this was V g s and there is no beta error, the transistor here would have given the same current I naught. Now, I have an increment delta V t. Okay. What is the increment in the drain current? Now, delta V t is the increment in V g s. Right? So, we know that the increment in drain current is nothing but dou i d by dou V g s times the increment in the gate voltage, which is nothing but 
g m times delta v g s and delta v g s is minus delta v t in this particular case because we have equivalently modeled a change in threshold voltage as a change in gate source voltage. So, what am I going to get because of delta v t i 2 will be i naught the nominal value minus g m times delta v t. Okay. So, the error due to error in current factor is this much, the error due to error in threshold voltage is that much. Okay. So, the total error is when you have both delta beta and delta v t will be i naught minus g m delta v t plus delta beta by beta 1 times i naught. Okay. So, as I said earlier please go through the complete expression neglect the higher order terms and make sure that this is exactly what you get. Okay. It is a good exercise in analysis also just to increase your confidence in this kind of calculations. Okay. Now, first of all does this expression make sense if delta v t is positive what does it mean the threshold voltage is increased and the current will reduce and we have minus g m delta v t. So, that part makes sense. Similarly, if the current factor increases delta beta will be positive and the current will be positive. So, the sign in front of that is also positive. So, that makes sense as well. Okay. Now, as usual when uh, we are dealing with mismatch we are not interested in calculating the exact current that is not possible because each of these delta v t delta beta are random quantities just like delta r and delta c. Okay. They have Gaussian distributions around some nominal value and what we describe is the standard deviation of that distribution because it is a Gaussian once you specify the standard deviation you have described the whole thing. And for the output current as well for I 2 we have to just specify a standard deviation. Okay. I 2 is I naught minus g m delta v t plus delta beta by beta 1 times I naught. So, I 2 minus I naught is given by minus g m delta v t plus delta beta by beta 1 times I naught. Okay. And normally what I am interested in finding out this is delta i is delta i in relation to the nominal value of I naught. Okay. So, I will divide the whole thing by I naught. Okay. So, delta i by I naught turns out to be minus g m by I naught delta v t plus delta beta by beta 1. Okay. Now, we know that g m can be described by many expressions and one of the expressions was 2 times I naught the drain current divided by V g s minus V t. This is the most convenient form to be used here. So, g m by I naught simply becomes minus 2 divided by V g s minus V t and I have delta V t over there plus delta beta by beta 1. Okay. We want to find the standard deviation or the variance of this one and we know that when we have uncorrelated uh, random variables delta v t and delta beta this is a very common assumption that uh, these different things are uncorrelated. Also uh, the variations of different kinds of components are uncorrelated from each other. Okay. We assume that variations in v t and variations in beta are uncorrelated. So, the variance of uh, this is given by 4 times the variance in V t divided by V g s minus V t square plus sigma beta square because sigma beta is nothing but the standard deviation of delta beta to the nominal value of beta. Okay. So, finally, the mismatch in a current mirror is given by this expression. The variance of uh, 
mismatch is four times the variance in Vt divided by Vgs minus Vt square plus variance of beta which really is the variance of uh, the difference in beta to the nominal beta and this in turn is given by 4 AVT square by VGS minus VT square times WL plus A beta square by WL. Okay. So, first of all what are all the things we can conclude from this clearly the current mismatch reduces with increasing WL. Okay. So, as you increase the size of the MOSFET the amount of mismatch reduces this is exactly what we saw with resistors and capacitors also. So, this is something that is consistent with what we had before also you see that there are two parts here one is due to VT mismatch and one is due to the current factor mismatch. The current factor mismatch of course depends only on uh, a sigma beta square or A beta and the one due to VT mismatch also has VGS minus VT whole square in the denominator. Okay. So, this is an interesting thing that if you want to reduce the effect of uh, VT mismatch you have to operate the transistor at a large VGS minus VT. Okay. Now, this again makes intuitive sense because as I said the charge in the transistor and everything that follows the current and so on are a function of VGS minus VT. Okay. So, it is the change in this that we are worried about. So, you can see that what we get is something like delta VT divided by VGS minus VT the amount of uh, fractional change in VGS minus VT. Now, just like everything else if you have a given change, but a very large nominal value Okay, let us say you make a 1 millimeter error when you are measuring uh, 10 centimeters you get some fraction you make a 1 millimeter error when you are measuring 1 kilometer obviously the relative error is much much smaller. So, if you have a large VGS minus VT then the same delta VT appears as a smaller fraction of that and the effect of uh, VT mismatch will be smaller. Okay. So, that is one thing to be kept in mind. Secondly you see that last time I said when you operate the transistor in subthreshold region that is when you operate a transistor with smaller and smaller VGS minus VTs uh, there are some benefits like increasing uh, transconductance for a given bias current. But here you see that the effect of VT mismatch will be worse okay, because delta VT divided by VGS minus VT will increase if VGS minus VT becomes smaller. Okay. So, there are trade offs everywhere we will uh, try to put all of them together and usually uh, the process of design is a judicious choice of parameters. So, that no single factor will uh, kill your circuit. Okay. The effect of VT mismatch reduces with increasing VGS minus VT. Okay. In fact, things are quite interesting as well. So, let us take a case where uh, the current factor mismatch is negligible. I okay. will say that A beta is 0 just hypothetically and you have only A V T in a given process. Okay. Now, uh, I want to make a current mirror with a given value of current let us say 200 microamperes. Now, what should I do to reduce the amount of mismatch? Now, if you just blindly look at this expression you could say that I would use a larger transistor and it could be larger in W or L okay? because if you look at this expression both W and L appear in the denominator, but we have to be a little more careful than that. Okay? The condition I imposed was that the current was given. Whereas, the expression that we have assumes a given VGS minus VT for a given current what do we have I naught is uh, beta by 2 VGS minus VT square. In other words VGS minus VT square is 2 I naught by beta. Okay. Now, substituting that we will have the standard deviation of uh, 
delta i by i naught to be 4 a b t square divided by this term okay. and what is beta after all 2 i naught by mu c ox w by l. Okay. That is what we have times W L that comes from A B T square by W L plus A beta square by W L and you can see that the W simply cancels out. Okay. So, we will have some constant two mu C ox by I naught A B T square by L square plus a beta square by W L. Okay. So, this thing tells you that for a given current if you want to reduce the effect of V T mismatch you just have to increase the length of the transistor there is no other way. Okay. Now, this makes sense again because for a given current if you want to increase the value of V G S minus V T you have to increase the length. You may also have to increase the W but that is not very that is not relevant. What is relevant? for the mismatch calculation is the increase in length. Okay. So, again we will see the effect of the length on the performance of the MOS transistor and see that all of these things will give you some trade offs if you make something better something else will get worse. Okay. So, this is about the mismatch in a current mirror and it gives you a good idea of what happens with regards to mismatch in a MOS transistor circuit. There are two sources of mismatch V T mismatch and current factor mismatch. And in a lot of circuits the V T mismatch is usually more dominant, but not universally so of course, you can have the current factor also to be quite dominant, but in many circuits V T mismatch turns out to be more dominant. Okay. Now, as with resistors and capacitors two identical MOSFETs two MOSFETs with the same W and same L will match to each other, but the physical layout of those things cannot be arbitrary. Okay. You have to lay them out in a careful way, so that the uh, parameters are identical to each other because there will always be some asymmetry in the direction and so on they have to be oriented in the same way etcetera etcetera. So, we will now briefly discuss the layout of MOS transistors. Now, first of all uh, as I mentioned earlier the proportionality to W is more or less exact, but the inverse proportionality to L is not. So, whenever you have want two transistors to be matched you do design them with identical values of L. Okay. This is sort of non-negotiable unless uh, there are some cases where you cannot do this at all you always do this with identical L. You will never make a current mirror with uh, the two uh, transistors having different lengths. Okay. And as with any other uh, component for good matching you should use multiples of identical units. Okay. So, for instance let us say I want a current mirror and let us say this is 2 micron by 0.18 micron and this is 4 micron by 0.18 micron. Okay, the idea here is that if I push I naught here I get a current 2 times I naught. Okay. Now, one possible layout of this I will show the top view as usual this is 2 micron and this is the same L 0.18 micron and the other one is like that. Okay. 4 micron by 0.18 micron. 
but if you do this the current in this transistor will not be twice the current in that transistor there will be small errors because this is a wider transistor the edge effects and so on will be somewhat different in this than that one okay so this is not the way to lay out two transistors where one of them has a width of 4 micron and the other one has a width of 2 microns okay the correct thing to do is have three transistors of width uh, 2 micron and length 0.18 micron the same l everywhere okay and let me call this the drain of this transistor and that is the source you have the drain the source you have the drain and the source okay and you connect these two transistors in parallel so effectively the schematic might be represented like that now all three transistors are 2 micron by 0.18 micron but these two are tied together so you can effectively think of them as a single transistor of 4 micron by 0.18 micron but the physical layout has to be something like that okay so perhaps this is the drain this is where you connect i not okay this is where i have i not and that's also connected to the gate and it's connected to all of the gates okay the sources of all of them are connected together to ground if this is ground and the drain sir connected together okay so this is the point from which you get the output current okay so you have to lay out identical units and connect some of them in parallel right now this is done very frequently with mos transistors let's say you have a width of 100 microns and a length of 0.18 micron and this is not as strange as it sounds you could even have width of a millimeter and a length of 0.18 micron you never ever lay out something so eccentric that is you will not make it 1 millimeter long like this and only 0.18 micron long okay if you make it 1 millimeter wide and 0.18 micron long it will be so wasteful of area that you will never ever do something like that what you do is in general when you have w by l w has some dimension and l has another dimension and i have already explained that it's not the ratio but the dimension of each one that matters it is cut up into n pieces of w by n divided by l in parallel okay and devices of w by n divided by l in parallel okay this can give you a reasonable aspect ratio and usually this w by n can be of course any value but typically let's say 0.5 microns to a few microns these are not sacred numbers these are all uh, usual guidelines but uh, sometimes these could be violated as well but these will ensure that you don't have a very eccentric aspect ratio okay and these uh, different devices are usually called uh, fingers because essentially when you have n devices it means that you have n gates of uh, w by n width okay so what i mean is the following top view of uh, such a layout will look like that the gate fingers are all laid out next to each other and the cross sectional view of an corresponding nmos might look like that okay all the way up to there and these are all 
the n plus regions okay i will mark them like that they correspond to these things okay so you will have n gate fingers each one will have a length l okay all of them will have the same length l and a width equal to w by n right and all these gates are connected in parallel by some wire outside and you also have to connect drains and sources in parallel and you can do that by making alternate ones source and other alternate ones drain so okay so perhaps this is a source this is a source this is a source and this is the drain this is the drain and so on okay and if you connect it up like that right this is also the source let's say and then you connect the drains also correspondingly okay you will see that this is the same as having all the gates of uh, n fingers connected together and n drains are connected together and n sources are connected together okay this is the gate so the way it has been laid out is that between two gates there is a diffusion region and that serves as the drain of this transistor as well as that transistor okay now sharing this diffusion region is very advantageous because an alternative way of doing this could be that you have a transistor like this and for each of these fingers you make a separate drain and source region let me draw it elsewhere so let's say this is one transistor and this is another transistor which is drawn separately okay now the problem with uh, something like this is that you have a drain diffusion here and a drain diffusion there and if you recall the small signal model of the mosfet each of these uh, diffusion junctions contributes to capacitance okay now by sharing the diffusion between uh, adjacent gates what you have done is effectively reduce the amount of this parasitic capacitance by half in fact you can go and calculate it please calculate the area of uh, these drain diffusions and the source diffusions when the number of fingers is very large uh, for this kind of layout versus where each of these transistors is separately laid out and things are connected in parallel you will find that the parasitic capacitance is reduced approximately by a factor of 2 okay so this is how most transistors are laid out you uh, cut up the most transistors into uh, units of some reasonable small widths usually around a micron and then you connect all of them in parallel now if you want a current mirror what you do is you just expand this array okay you have as many of these units as you want and connect the drains and sources appropriately okay this kind of uh, layout is used very very often and the moment you start using a, a layout tool to do the layout of the MOS transistor please start using this method okay please do not use uh, separate layouts of MOSFET or uh, certainly not different lengths for uh, devices that are supposed to be matched or devices that are laid out in different orientations and so on they should all be uh, laid out in a array of fingers like this and if you want a current mirror let us say I will just continue this array with uh, more fingers and remember the terminals of the two transistors in a current mirror there is some common uh, terminal right the source of uh, the two transistors are common okay so this uh, terminal between the transistor corresponding to m1 and transistor current pointing to m2 can be the source terminal okay and then you can connect up the rest and also while laying out uh, resistors and capacitors i mentioned that for good matching you put dummy devices at either ends in this case you put dummy fingers okay again i'll show it quickly with an example of a current mirror let me assume that i have a current mirror and this consists of two fingers of 1 micron by 
0.18 micron and this consists of four fingers of 1 micron by 0.18 micron okay now in order to draw these things quickly i'll show the gator sticks okay this is a 1 micron width and i have diffusion all over if you study books on layout you will see that a gate polysilicon drawn over diffusion forms a mosfet okay so first of all for m1 i need two fingers let's say these two form m1 these vertical lines denote the gates perhaps i will draw them in a different color so these are gates okay and for the right side transistor m2 i need uh, four fingers okay and i'll connect all of those gates together okay and because this is a current mirror this is also connected to that one okay that forms this terminal here now for the drain of m1 this is what i have this is the drain of m1 and the source of m1 and m2 which are common will be connected like that okay this is the source of m1 and m2 and the drain of m2 will be connected in parallel okay these two regions connected in parallel will be the drain of m2 and finally you see that there are totally six gate fingers the ones on the outside have only one neighbor whereas ones on the inside have two neighbors so we also include dummy fingers on either side i'll show one dummy finger at each end but in some cases you may have to use more than one two or three okay so that is like having two more transistors in the circuit and remember the source terminal is common to this transistor and that as well so the source of this happens to be grounded in this circuit and source of that is also grounded but these transistors are not useful transistors i have no role for them in my circuit so they should really carry zero current so that means that what i can do is to connect the gate to the source if i do this vgs will be zero and the current will be zero okay so for these uh, dummy transistors i will connect the gate to the source okay in a real integrated circuit you have many layers of metal and you have to arrange the layers of metal so that you come up with uh, this particular layout so this for instance is an example of a reasonable layout for a current mirror where you take care of matching uh, very well okay that is you have uh, each transistor laid out as uh, multiples of identical units one of them has two units the other one has four units and you also take care to put dummy transistors at both ends so that all of the gate fingers that form the current mirror see an identical environment now there is also one more thing that you can do you can see that m2 is to the right of m1 in this case we have m2 here and m1 there but that may or may not be the best layout sometimes you may want to have a common centroid for m2 and m1 so what you then do is you make the middle two fingers m1 and these two and those two combined will be m2 okay so that m1 and m2 have the same centroid geometrically that way the matching between them will be best okay even if there is some linear gradient in the parameters of the transistor across the chip they'll get cancelled out and you get identical behavior okay now this is a lot of detail but to get an ic to work successfully you have to mind all these details okay because one of the differences between uh, designing a discrete uh, component circuit and an integrated circuit is that in a discrete component circuit you don't have freedom to play around with the insides of the device you are given the package device you solder them on a board as carefully as possible and then uh, your job is done whereas on an integrated circuit there is freedom to even uh, uh, modify the geometry of individual devices okay 
and it has to be done very carefully so that you get the best result that is possible. Now one last point about layout. Now it turns out that while these uh, transistors are being made you have dopants being diffused from the top and there is some asymmetry. There is some asymmetry in transistors which carry current in that direction and transistors which carry current in that direction. Okay. Now to avoid this a uh, simple technique is to always use an even number of gate fingers. Okay. What I mean is for instance in this particular current mirror that I took the example of earlier the currents go from drain to source. right? So in this transistor the current goes that way and in that transistor it goes that way okay? and we have no idea what the extent of asymmetry is and so on. But if we do have an even number of fingers we always get odd plus even together. Okay? So whatever asymmetry there is once you add up the two that will go away and the unit becomes odd plus even. So it is always recommended that you use an even number of fingers. Again sometimes you may have to violate this because that is not uh, really possible but as far as possible always use an even number of fingers. Okay. So far we have dealt with MOS uh, small signal model and also calculated the effect of mismatch in a MOS transistor right? and uh, found out and discussed uh, layout techniques to minimize mismatch in a MOS transistor circuit. We took the current mirror as an example but later we will come across many circuits where we need MOS transistors to be identical and exactly the same principles apply. So far we have looked at many characteristics of uh, MOS transistors like uh, mismatch and uh, other small signal characteristics. Now what I will do is to discuss the speed of a MOS transistor in a very general way. The actual speed of operation that is the unity gain frequency and so on depend on the specifics of the circuit but this is a way to characterize the technology. Okay. Now you hear in particularly in connection with the digital circuits that they keep becoming faster and faster with more and more advanced technologies. Let us see if there is a measure of speed for analog circuits. Now this is a very generic measure based on the performance of a single transistor. What we do is this is a MOS transistor. and this is the equivalent circuit. I will ignore the body effect and other things. I will also ignore CGD. I will assume that this is a MOS transistor operating in a, a saturation region. Which is where we normally have the MOS transistors. So it has a CGS. I will assume CGD to be 0 okay. and it may also have some CDB. Now what uh, is done normally is to evaluate the short circuit current gain of such a device that is in the small signal picture you apply an IS let me call it IG that is the gate current and measure the value of ID that is you apply a small signal short circuit and measure ID. Now this seems like a strange thing to do to apply a current to the gate here we are talking about high frequency currents and that can flow into the gate. And also this kind of test was previously used for bipolar transistors which were very popular. There it was very common to characterize the bipolar transistor with the current gain. Now the same thing is borrowed to characterize the speed of MOS transistors as well. Now this is the incremental picture in reality it has to be biased and the short circuit and this current sources are small signal incremental sources. If I write the small signal equivalent of this. The circuit is really really simple. I have uh, IS, I will show it as a function of frequency, and I have a CGS, a GM. And I could have some parasitic capacitance from drain to source or substrate, but because it is terminated by a short circuit that is ignored. So I will have GM times VGS as the current, where VGS is this voltage. It is very obvious that VGS equals. IS by SCGS. Okay. So the drain current will be simply GM by 
SCGS times IS. Okay. So the current gain ID by IG will be GM by SCGS of the MOS transistor and at a frequency S equals J omega if you evaluate the magnitude we get G m by omega C G S. Okay. Now you see that this the MOS transistor also behaves like an integrator if you consider the input to be a current and the output to be a current. Now the unity gain frequency of this integration of mod I D by I G is defined to be the transit frequency F T and that is of course given by G M by C G S. Okay. Sorry this is the omega T, this is the transit frequency in radians per second omega T and if you want F T you simply divide the result by 2 pi. Okay. As I said earlier these terms and uh, the definition are borrowed from bipolar transistors. Now uh, omega t being gm by cgs we can calculate it for uh, some transistor biased at a given vgs minus vt. Okay. So if you have a transistor biased at some vgs minus vt the value of gm is given by mu c ox w by l. VGS minus VT and CGS itself is given by C ox WL. Okay. So, what we have here is sorry 2 thirds C ox WL in saturation region. So, what we have here is 3 by 2 mu VGS minus VT divided by L square. So, both uh, C ox and W cancel out. So, you see that the transit frequency depends only on the mobility, the operating point VGS minus VT and the length of the transistor. Now, you also hear that as you go to more advanced technologies, the minimum length goes on reducing. So, this transit frequency goes on increasing for a given bias voltage. Okay. Now, if you take a, a process technology, the transit frequency will be specified okay for some value of vgs minus vt that is typically equal to the power supply or a large fraction of the power supply now what does this frequency mean it doesn't by itself mean much okay because this transit frequency for uh, modern technology could be in the many tens or hundreds of uh, gigahertz because it's uh, biased at a very high vgs minus vt and in reality we bias transistors with a small vgs minus vt such as 100 or 200 millivolts it doesn't mean too much but it's a measure of the speed capability of the transistor that is if for the same VGS minus VT if you have go to a shorter channel technology the maximum possible speed will increase. Okay. So, do not pay too much attention to the absolute value of the frequency it is only whether it is improving with different process nodes or not that is what matters. Okay. Now what can we say from this now, first of all before I go further let me say that this is uh, assuming square law and if you assume velocity saturation. The speed of carriers uh, in the device is mu times VGS minus VT by L. Okay, that is the mobility times the electric field in the device, and this will be replaced by V sat. Okay, so in case of a velocity saturated device, this will change to three by two V sat by L. So the one over L square dependence will go away, and you will have one over L dependence. But in either case if you go to shorter and shorter channel uh, MOS transistors the speed will increase. Okay. The reason I discussed all of this is to give you a flavor of uh, trade off between speed, accuracy and uh, power consumption in a very general way. Okay. Now all three are important you would like your circuits to consume very little power, you would like them to be very accurate that is very little mismatch related error and you would also like them to work at very high speeds. Now what does it mean for a circuit to work at very high speeds? We have a measure of speed at 
okay and this has to be high which means we use as short a channel transistor as possible this is for high speed and you would also like to operate the transistors with a high VGS minus VT. Now for high accuracy we have earlier uh, derived the expression for uh, mismatch for instance in a current mirror okay I will just use that as a representative expression. So the error in a current mirror is given by something like this. So to have high precision you would like to have a small variance of error okay high precision or accuracy you would like to use long channel L the channel length must be long and also a large transistor okay large W as well. Now in general for high speed we need to have small parasitic capacitances okay and finally for uh, low power we need to have a small bias current and we know that the drain current is related to uh, the GM that you want to realize and you can use the expressions VGS minus VT by 2 times GM I will assume that GM is something that is fixed and you want to realize a certain value of GM or in weak inversion region it could be eta Vt times gm okay. So for low power operation you would like to minimize id and that means that you operate with a low value of vgs minus vt okay. So clearly you see a conflict between these three requirements for high speed you need high vgs minus vt but for low power you need the opposite in fact way you to get high speed is to pump a large current into a small capacitor okay. Similarly for a high speed device you need a short channel length and also in general minimize all parasitic capacitances but uh, here uh, for high accuracy you need to have a long channel L and in general a large device which also implies large parasitic capacitances. Okay. Now also generally for low value of mismatch you have to operate with a high value of VGS minus VT and that is in conflict with this low power requirement which says that for a given GM you have to operate with a high, uh, low VGS minus VT okay. So this should give you a flavor of uh, the trade offs between uh, precision speed and low power as an analog designer your job will be to manage this trade offs as well as possible okay. Thank you see you in the next lecture.